Good day, everyone. Welcome to this conversation. We are looking forward to an opportunity to share with you. I am joined by a host of amazing and wonderful people and experts and I'm looking forward to sharing together and hearing as we engage this conversation. I am Kanika Jones and I am at Howard University in a dual capacity, both in our School of Business and in our chapel office. I am the former Associate Dean of the Chapel at Howard and I've been responsible for coordinating a number of interfaith initiatives across our campus along with working with our interfaith advisors in a number of different areas. I'm on the board of the Association for Chaplaincy and Spiritual Life in Higher Education, uh, which is formerly NACUC, which emerged with Acura, and I uh, have had the opportunity to interact wi widely with IFYC, uh, with White House interfaith conferences, and a number of other things. I am joined today by Donna Austin. She is an anthropologist, writer, and public intellectual whose body of work focuses on race, ethnicity, gender, religion, protest, and social movements, as well as media representation in Islam in America. She's completing her dissertation at Rutgers University, and, which is an ethnography of Black Muslim activism and spiritual protest in the Black Lives Matter era. Also joined today by Dr. Monica Coleman. She is the professor of Africana Studies at the University of Delaware and has degrees from Harvard, Vanderbilt, and Claremont Graduate University, and has received funding from a number of leading foundations, including Ford, Andrew Mellon, and the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship Foundation. She answered her call to ministry at the age of 19, is an ordained minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, where I am also ordained, and is an initiate in the traditional Yoruba religion. Also today joining us for this conversation is Lisa Doy. She's the president of the Japanese American Citizens League of Chicago, which is a civil rights organization and the co-chair of Tsuru for Solidarity, a grassroots network of progressive Japanese Americans. She's a member of the Midwest Buddhist Temple, a historically Japanese American Jodo Shinsu Temple in Chicago's Old Town, and is a doctoral student at Indiana University. Lastly, and certainly not least, joining us is Rabbi Sandra Lawson, who is currently serving as the Associate Chaplain for Jewish Life and the Senior Jewish Educator at Hillel at Elon University in Elon, North Carolina. She received her ordination from the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in June of 2018 and holds a master's degree in sociology with a focus on environmental justice and race. Rabbi Sandra is an Army veteran who brings a diverse background to her role as rabbi and uses her experience to help others understand the diversity of Jewish people. And she's determined to build a more inclusive Jewish community where all who want to come are welcome and diversity is embraced and we can come together to learn and to pray. And so as we begin this conversation today, I wanted to start off with a lighter question, um, given the season that we are in and um, many of uh, of the decorations and traditions that we are now seeing in our communities and even reflected on television, uh, if we turn it on, <laughs> if we dare. Um, but we're in a season that is typically associated with a host of cultural and religious celebrations and traditions. And so I wanted to start off by asking our panelists, even in the midst of COVID concerns, what rituals or celebrations are you looking forward to at this time? And we will um, start our conversation maybe with Donna, if you could start us off. Hi, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, thank you to all of the organizers and to my co-panelists. Um, I would say, honestly, well, as a Muslim, um, you know, our calendar um, is a solar calendar. And as such, you know, um, it's, it's a little bit shorter, so about 10 days shorter than the Gregorian calendar. And so our sacred, uh, our sacred uh, rituals, uh, ritual seasons tend to go throughout, the, like they go travel throughout the year. So yeah, at some point Ramadan, which is the month of fasting uh, occurs in the summer at other times it occurs in the winter. Um, we are now in the, at uh, currently Ramadan and, and, and some of the most sacred uh, rituals of the Islamic calendar have already passed. Um, we've gone through most of them in quarantine, um, you know, starting in like June and then 
the Hodge season, which you know came later, a couple months later. So we've kind of gone through the most important celebrations of our sacred calendar. But I, I can I can say also though, like for me, um, as somebody, I was raised Christian. I be became Muslim later in life. Um, I still look forward to this time of the year, regardless of whether or not it coincides with my religious, um, you know, my sacred religious calendar. Um, I look forward to this time of the year as sort of a time as, of rest and renewal. Um, you know, and, and it's something that I always look forward to every year, like this, this, this permission that um, I, because of the convergence of, of holy uh, observations from so many traditions, you know, converges at this time of the year, there's sort of this license to begin to unplug and shut down and sort of, you know, take, you know, put work to the side um, and sort of spend spend more time with family and friends and that sort of thing. I mean, that's obviously complicated this year in the context of the pandemic, but especially I think given the year that we've all had, um, this, um, this chance to just shut down and sit still um, is is really, really, really urgent, I think, for all of us, regardless of whether we're officially celebrating a holy day on a calendar or not. And that um, that to me is, is 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 really a sacred practice, right? This this chance to just, you know, take stock of what's happened over the last year, um, you know, just you know, sit with it, you know, breathe. Um, think about, um, you know, as we think about the, the coming of the new year, also sort of to think about, you know, how we're going to move forward, right, given, you know, everything that we've experienced in the last 12 months. So for me, that's the thing that I'm looking forward to the most, just this opportunity to sort of breathe a bit, hopefully, even if it's just a week or so, but just to really sit still and, um, you know, and reflect um, and think about how we're we're all going to uh, how we're all going to get through whatever is coming ahead. Yes, absolutely. Um, the reflective time, the stillness, um, the time to be still and to um, center is so important and so central. I'm sure to many of us. Um, Dr. Coleman, would you mind sharing? Sure. Um, my family we're Kwanzaa keepers, so Kwanzaa is really our big holiday for this season. Um, and we're kind of figuring out how to adjust it since we usually have this huge gathering and just pack people into the house and eat soul food and talk about um, principles that are important to us. And so I've never, I mean, I've always set up our Kwanzaa thing on the 26th, but I was like, maybe we'll set it up early this year. And I did kind of go down a little Etsy rabbit hole of how to decorate your house for Kwanzaa. <laughs> And, you know, figuring out how to do it by Zoom. And my daughter, who is eight, is like, I'm going to lead the game for kids in our own Zoom room, you know? So we are thinking of how to celebrate these in different ways. And like, maybe everyone eats what they have in front of them. Uh, but we've always had these great big potlucks. So we feel kind of the way in which we're not able to celebrate like we're used to, but it is kind of pushing us to think creatively. And, you know, once I have Kwanzaa decorations, you know, I'll start hanging them after Thanksgiving like everybody else. I'll go. I think our, our host is frozen. Um, yeah, so um, the Jewish community, I, by the next month, we would have gone, we have gone through all of our major holidays in COVID. And uh, um, we have one holiday coming up. It's not a, it's not um, a holiday, it's in the Torah. Um, it's Hanukkah and it's, um, it's, it has, religiously, it has a different meaning than it does secularly, I think, and more modern Jews um, um, might see it sort of as a, holiday that goes go alongside like uh, Christmas. Um, but it's not technically one of our major holidays. And so um, we had to learn how to um, do Passover um, uh, in, in, in co with COVID. And we had to figure out how to do our major holidays, uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and the 10 days in between um, in COVID. And um, uh, I'm thinking about my Christian colleagues right now who are about to figure out how to do 
um, their Christmas celebrations um, with Zoom and um, everything. And one of the things I've been very grateful for is that um, the Jewish community sort of realized the importance of celebration, how important it is to celebrate, um, and and that we have to celebrate. We have to figure out ways to reinvent our holidays. We can't because we can't just not do it. And um, and that was really amazing to see uh, Jews all over the world try to figure out and reinvent all of our major holidays. And uh, what I'm one thing I'm looking forward to um, in December and January. So kind of looking at the holiday of Hanukkah, where we take a light. Um, and I sort of see light as blessing. And each night we add a new light to our Hanukkah, our menorah, and um, to sort of, you know, we don't take light away, we add light and let our light shine. And I'm looking forward to that. And I'm also um, really looking forward to the secular, the secular time. I work at a university and it's really quiet. And so it's a really good time for reflect reflecting, like Donna said, and I am looking forward to spending more time with my, my three dogs and my wife. My wife might be upset I put the dogs before I put the wife. <laughs> um, uh, but she, but that, you know, it's just been a really crazy time and I'm looking forward to just having some, some calm and some peace and, and uh, maybe turning off some devices. Thank you. It's been great to hear all of these responses. Um, I think just picking up on a few themes, I think it's not just sort of this end of year season, but this whole year has asked this question of how do you maintain physical distancing while keeping the need for social solidarity? Um, and for me in, in Buddhist practice, that's sort of the living teaching of, of interbeing um, that COVID-19 has shown that, you know, my life is not only my life, but is deeply tied to the lives of other people. Um, and so that's just been something I've been reflecting on all year long. Um, and for me and my family, uh, a really big holiday we celebrate at the end of the year is New Year's. Um, and typically we cook for two days and then we have an open house that has about a hundred guests that come through over the course of the day. And obviously, you know, we can't do that this year. So without those sort of external trappings of this celebration, it's really made me think about what is core to me about this New Year's celebration and what are the things that um, are the most essential. And something that I'm really grateful for is that over the course of this year, I've actually been able to spend a lot more time talking with my cousins um, who we typically celebrate New Year's with. And so while I can't have all the food because I'm not gonna cook all that food just for myself, um, I am gonna spend New Year's Eve, um, you know, in community with them. And I'm also really grateful. It's, it's making me reflect a lot on the gratitude I have for my ancestors and those who came before me who passed these traditions down to me. Um, and my family lost uh, a particularly impressive New Year's matriarch this year. And we're not gonna be able to gather to celebrate her and, and all that she's given us. But I think that's really just in teaching these cooking traditions, in teaching these cultural traditions, a deep sense of gratitude um, for those who came before me, who, who gave me the ability to have these kinds of celebrations. Thank you all for sharing and thank you for jumping in and going right with it as I attempt to connect on multiple devices via multiple Wi-Fi settings and all of them are conspiring against me in this conversation at the moment. Um, but this is what we do. Um, we build community and we fill in the gaps for one another. And so much of what has been shared is just about that and about how we are figuring out how to fill in those gaps, um, even as we confront so much of what our society is facing. And so um, picking up on Lisa's last comment uh, about um, so many of the traditions and how they've been passed down. Uh, so many of our traditions are, they really do predate us. And one of the challenges I think that we experience often is that we are challenged to pick up these pieces from the past, some of which we understand, some of which we don't, um, many of which our communities may not understand, and yet merge them with what is present. And so I wanna ask everyone, can you recall a space and time when you've been able to either create or witness the creation of a new ritual or practice um, that bears significance in your community? And that could be within your immediate family, it could be in your professional life, it could be in the educational setting, 
and it could be in the broader um, sense of community as we define it. Um, but a time where you have been able to see or experience or participate in the creation of some new ritual and practice. And I'll leave that open to any of you. Yeah, I'll, um, I didn't witness this, but I've been leaning on it a lot. A colleague of mine, Michael Knopf, uh, recognized that, um, so in the Jewish tradition, we have like 613 commandments, not 10, which if you take six plus one plus three, it equals 10, but that's, you know, that's some play on numbers of people that came long before me. Um, and um, realize that wearing a mask should be a commandment, should be a mitzvah, should be a holy thing, and actually created a blessing um, that we have shared with our students to sort of help them ritualize the wearing of a mask. And so the, the Hebrew is Baruchatana Elohenu Melakala, Mashir Kishana Mitzatov, it's Yuvanu, um, Ashirat Hanefesh. And basically, thank you, God, for um, uh, who has sanctified us with a commandment and commanded us to protect life. And so sort of ritualizing um, this, 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 this weird thing that we have to do now. Uh, I've, I've seen students sort of embrace that and, and sort of make it a Jewish thing and make it something that we are commanded to do. And so um, I don't know Michael Knopf, we're Facebook friends in that kind of way, but one day I hope to meet him and say, thank you. Thank you for that, Rabbi Sandra. Um, if I can just quickly jump in here, I think for me, you know, um, as as a as a Black Muslim in the U.S., um, I think coming to Islam for African Americans for the last eighty or so years really has been um, an expression of newness and spirituality in response to many of the challenges of white supremacy that many saw um, as embedded in. Um, and, and particularly in white American Christianity. And so I think, um, although of course, Islam is very, you know, very much older than, you know, American slavery um, and that sort of thing, in so many ways, um, what has happened um, and, how, and, the, and the Islam that I stepped into, right, from, from my own Christian upbringing um, was, was created a new in some ways, um, and you know, even you know, by by people who were responding to um, the experiences that they. So we have, to, you know, there's a lot that we figured out, right? It, we made it our own, right? We put our own stamp on it, um, and in many ways, it's connected to um, global Islam that one might see in other parts of the world, but it has its own distinctive flavor, and that's something that's very beautiful about it. Um, and it's 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 created its own, you know, its own tradition of protest. And social justice work. Um, it's, you know, its own, I mean, and that's in, you know, and this is some of the work that I explore in my dissertation. That's something that you'll see, for example, in the rhetoric of someone like Malcolm X or Muhammad Ali, um, you know, in context that we would traditionally identify as protest, but also the very act of saying, you know, I'm refusing, right? I'm refusing this tradition that has dehumanized me and, and enslaved my ancestors um, and has taught me that, um, that I am inferior. Um, and that God sanctioned my inferiority. And so to say no to that, right, in some ways um, through a, a wide range of ritual practices um, has been something that about um, the collective tradition of Black Islam in the U.S. that, um, that I find very beautiful and empowering. So, um, and that shows up in a thousand and one different ways, right? Um, and, you know, my own journey as a convert, um, there's many times where, you know, I've had to figure out what, it looks like to be a Muslim, you know, given who I am as a black woman. Um, and that may not look like, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a person from six, you know, from seventh century Persia, right? Um, you know, looks very different. And I have to figure that out and I have to make sense of it and I have to and I have to make it work for me, right? And and for my children and you know and for the people in my immediate community. And so there's a lot of ways that I think religion in general regardless of our tradition, the ways that we inherit it. Um, I, I like to think of religion and ritual as mechanisms that help people to make sense of the world in which they live, um, the material, the political conditions in which they find themselves, the historical uh, genealogies and circumstances that, um, that they're a part of. Um, and that 
it, that creates so many opportunities for, for newness, renewal, um, for continuity, but also for innovation and creativity that I think are, are, are everywhere. Thank you for that, Donna. Uh, as you were talking, I was remembering a book that in my tradition, in the Christian tradition, um, somewhat changed my perspective on when Jacqueline Grant wrote about white women's Christ and black women's Jesus. And it was giving permission for us to really acknowledge that we understood our version of our own religion very differently. And we experienced it very differently and still do. Uh, and so I um, wanna ask if anyone else wants to share uh, some of the ways that race and ethnicity inform or impact um, your beliefs and those of your community. Well, you know, I think when you first, uh, when you asked the question and you said community includes family, that made me think a little bit differently about how I had been thinking of ritual and race and ethnicity before. And, you know, because I think I'm very intentional about what I do with my family, um, maybe even more so than I am in ways outside of my family. And I grew up um, in Black Baptist and AME churches, and I grew up memorizing a lot of scripture. Right, um, because you had Easter pageants and Christmas pageants, and you know, I learned you know the Lord's Prayer, and I learned different graces. I went to Catholic school, and you kind of learn to memorize these different things um, because you were then going to be this kid on display. And I kind of approached faith with my daughter when she was born through music and saying, "Well, you know, she just got here, so it's probably not going to be as meaningful to have these words." So we decided we were going to sing um, our faiths to her and sing prayers. And so a really big part of our rituals um, in my home are singing prayers. And as I think on it, most of them come from African-American <laughs> traditions. So we sing um, prayer songs that come out of, a, um, that a lot of them that Ricky Byers Beckwith wrote for Agape International Spiritual Center um, as graces, as our grace, we sing uh, Sweet Honey in the Rock is a bedtime prayer. <laughs> I sing spirituals as lullabies. And, um, and I realized that this, I don't, I don't name them. I probably should <laughs> um, to my daughter, but she just knows these songs. And I realized that when she was asked by her music class at school to bring in a folk song she's learned at home, she want, the song she wanted to teach them is a song for Oshun that comes from Candomblé. And I was like, wow, I just, I didn't realize she was paying as much attention as I thought she was. I'm like, yes, that is a folk song. <laughs> and so I think, you know, one way we've really kind of continued our culture and faith. In fact, my daughter gets really upset when I use the word religion or faith. And she'll say, no, mommy, it's our culture. And I'll be like, yeah, okay. You know, <laughs> I mean, in one way she's right. And also not the hill to die on and argue with the kid about. But I was like, it is our culture and our faith and our race, and they're all mixed together. And as she tries to figure out race, as most kids do, she's like, well, how do you know if someone's African-American? Like, can you look and tell? Because people who you tell me are African-American look really different from each other. And I'll remind her, I'm like, well, it's also about culture and about history and shared experiences and values. She goes, but how do you know that when you look at it? I'm like, you don't, you know? <laughs> and so um, for us, you know, singing our faith and singing a lot of the songs uh, from various parts of my faith and culture are, have become a big way in which ritual, we ritualized in the community of my family. And she, I hear her sharing with her cousins, well, we don't say grace like this, we say it like this, right? Um, and has become really significant. And I think in some ways, a kind of trans-religious way of uh, living out what, what we believe. Thank that you for that. Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, I was just gonna say that that made me think about my own experience with my parents where um, I would guess I would say I'm accidentally Buddhist, but my parents' intention was to bring me to a Buddhist temple so I could have Japanese American peers my own age. 
And I was just attracted as well to the Buddhist teachings, but that wasn't their intention in bringing me to temple. Their intention was to have this social network to build my racial and ethnic identity. Um, and I'm really grateful for it. Uh, I don't know if my parents are as grateful for sort of my appreciation of Buddhism, but I also think about, you know, Japanese American Buddhism is, um, very much shaped by Japanese American history in the United States and is a very Protestantized form of Buddhism that would be unrecognizable in Japan. Um, that it, we, you know, we currently have a Sunday service with singing and, and a sermon. Um, and you know, in Japan, this would be like, what are you doing? Um, and then I also think about, you know, most most people in Japan today would identify as probably Buddhist and Shinto. And so there isn't sort of this dichotomy of religious identity the way there is in the United States as well. Um, but during World War II, the US government classified Shintoism as a state practice and therefore um, something that could be stopped in a way that you know religious freedom would not allow a religion, a religious practice um, to be censored in that same kind of way. And so I think about all the things that were lost um, and in particular Shinto's relationship to um, a more spiritual world, a world in which, you know, the natural world in which ancestors are sort of ensouled. And I'm gonna take this back to the previous question about new rituals. Um, so one of the groups that I organized with is called Sudu for Solidarity and the word Sudu uh, comes from the Japanese word for crane, in, in this case, referring to origami cranes. And so, you know, origami cranes have a long sort of cultural history and symbolic history, but for the past year and a half, Sudu for Solidarity has been sort of politicizing that icon um, and that action to um, mobilize folded origami tsudu for a political purpose. So this past weekend, I was at a protest at Cook County Jail in Chicago, um, led by a woman named Cassandra Greer Lee, whose husband died in the jail from COVID-19. And she's been working tirelessly for several months to sort of bring attention to Cook County Jail as a COVID-19 hotspot and the lack of care being provided by the sheriff's office towards people who are incarcerated there. And this weekend, she asked us to bring um, 5,400 paper tsudu to represent the 5,400 people who are incarcerated there. And I think one of the things that I'm trying to push myself to think about is thinking about these papers to do as more than just a representation of people, but what if they contained the souls of those people? And how would I treat these objects um, if I could really sort of believe in that kind of ensoulment or in that kind of um, more spiritual relationship between this object and the person that we're asking it to represent? Um, so I think that's something that I've been pushing myself in my own spiritual practice too, while also seeing the the political possibility in this kind of mobilization. Thank you, Lisa. As I listen to you all, you know, I'm struck by really part of the unique um, seat that we sit in in encountering people from so many different backgrounds, so many different cultures, um, so many different faiths, and we actually have a question that um, came up about um, higher education, which we know um, most campuses in the 21st century will tout themselves as diverse campuses. Um, that is code language that uh, campuses want to use to ensure that they are stating that they have um, the type of population that will educate each other. And so as we consider that, even within our individual traditions, we note nuances and differences in how we experience them. And that can be so much more challenging in the kind of melting pot um, that a university campus is supposed to be. And so the question that has come up is, is there some advice that we would offer to a higher education professional that's looking at launching an interfaith initiative at a university? And are there any resources that we would want to recommend to that person? And so as our panelists are reflecting on it, um, I will say, I, I, when James Cone released that last book, um, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, uh, that had a tremendous impact on our campus. And I know it's a little dated now, it's been a few years, um, but 
the conversation that it started was amazing. Um, what we have done, Howard University, in particular, is as we recognize the inconsistencies in our own faith traditions, and we enter into a non into a non judgmental. judgmental In terms of what we do with others, uh, other panelists position. Um, I have like maybe a part of the answer, <laughs> and I'm like, I know that Rabbi Sandra has something for us, but <laughs> um, I think one thing I thought about being on campuses that where there's a lot of religious diversity, and I spent many years at um, a theological school that had a, a good amount of religious diversity, Christians and non-Christians and Jains and a number of other different religions. Um, one thing that always seemed to me as, and we, tr we thought about how do we do this? How do, you know, everyone's got a different holy day, <laughs> which days do you not have things on? And you think about how you kind of navigate that. It really reminded me that a lot of our academic rituals are, you know, are kind of common rituals that don't privilege one religion over another. And what, um, and that it's a nice time to actually sink into some of those academic rituals, um, whether those are things like not just kind of commencement, but, and um, I'm thinking of my experience working at Bennett College for Women where there were lots and lots of rituals <laughs> and convocations uh, for all types of, of things, right? That were not religious might be honors convocation or Martin Luther King Day convocation or opening convocation for each semester, but chances to kind of do things around either an academic calendar or around the things that we share academically, um, <clears throat> whether that's, okay, we're celebrating certain kinds of scholarship, right, new scholarship amongst our faculty, or we're celebrating this kind of thing. Um, and it, it, it gives us a chance, I think, to, to remember that there actually are rituals that aren't tied to one faith or another that we can all partake in. So that's one little contribution, which isn't exactly a resource, but that really in academic institutions in higher ed, we actually do have a number of rituals and sometimes we just forget everything but commencement, but that they are, are there for our, our kind of taking, so to say, and for drawing community around that. This is gonna sound, I don't mean this to sound flippant, but it's a serious answer. Um, like. The university chaplain at Elon University, Jan Fuller, um, is an amazing resource. She built our multi-faith um, program from the ground up. And now we have five university, we have five associate chaplains, uh, or five chaplains on campus. Um, and we all like owe her, uh, like I wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for her, but she stressed the importance of, of a multi-faith campus. And the other thing I wanna, and so, I want to say that to reach out to Jan Fuller, uh, university chaplain at Elon University, because she's about to retire. So, uh, and she's a, a, an amazing non judgmental resource. And I have learned so much uh, from the time that I've been with her. The other thing I want to say is that um, working with a lot of my Christian colleagues, um, one piece of advice I would say is that there's a difference between interfaith and intrafaith. And I think me, people often think of when they're doing programming, they're, they're actually thinking intrafaith. So the diversity within um, one tradition, within the Christian tradition, and um, um, try to figure out ways to include more voices. And also, um, you know, recognize that I, I, I think just living in a Christian centric society, many people think that they, many Christians I have met think that they understand Judaism or understand Islam and they actually don't. Um, and, um, and so reaching out to people who actually represent those uh, diversity, of, represent that diversity of practice or represent those faith traditions um, will um, go a long way. Thank you. Is there any other advice we'd offer to our colleagues who are looking at starting something on a university campus? Um, I would just uh, just quickly uh, second what Rabbi uh, Sandra said. Um, there is a way in which um, I think even the things that aren't necessarily marked as religious um, 
are actually um, reflective of a, of a Christian centric way of sort of thinking and operating that often sort of, I mean, even, I mean, this is everything from not just sort of what the chaplain's office may do, but I mean, the academic calendar <laughs> itself is often, you know, I mean, as a Muslim professor, you know, I mean, the number of times that I've had to, you know, think about what I was going to do, much less like how, forget about it. I mean, my students are sort of excused, um, you know, for religious observances that, you know, that they want to sort of be absent away from class for, but as a professor, often, you know, it's like, okay, do I cancel class? Can I cancel class? Is it easier to just go ahead and teach on Eid because it falls on a Tuesday and the calendar doesn't accommodate, um, the calendar doesn't accommodate my faith uh, time frame, right? Um, you know, so those are ways I think um, that, you know, I think, if you start from the assumption that this is not, you know, sort of a straightforwardly Christian environment, right? I think you have the opportunity to actually create something that um, that has at, at its center sort of a way of seeing people who are otherwise marginalized by be even just everyday activities, even in an environment where people mean to do better, or they are they're sort of intentional about creating a more inclusive space. Um, I think there's way there are so many ways in which you know just the basic operating framework. Um, center some experiences at the expense of others. Um, I think if we can sort of keep those things in mind, we'll do a much better job. Yeah, I'm gonna just echo. Take Lisa, I saw you on mute challenge. for a second. Did you still want to share something as a part of that? Uh, Sandra, do you wanna finish your thought? I was just gonna say like, I just can't scream loud enough that academic calendar um, I, I, I just, I, that is like a big, big thing. Yeah, I just wanted to underscore what was put in the chat. When I was in college, my university partnered with IFYC. I found it to be very helpful as an undergraduate student. Um, and also a lot of my um, undergraduate experiences with, with interfaith work were centered around service learning, which maybe is an outdated model now, but I think that in whatever way made it sort of more palatable for the university administration to find it to be a legitimate practice um, because it fit within other community service and service learning objectives that the university had outlined. Um, so if that's just more a more purely administrative lane or way for you to get a foot in the door, I think that was something that was beneficial for me. Thank you, Lisa. A lot of what I hear, you know, is as we think about race, um, this topic, religion and ritual, the need for us to step back and rethink all of our assumptions. And, you know, even as we consider some of the comments that we've already made, so many of these assumptions are deeply rooted and start in our childhood. And we expect that that is just the way that the world works operate and where the center belongs. And a lot of the work that I think all of us do is giving permission to begin to ask some questions, to admit that there are some things we actually don't know, um, and to admit that there are many things within our traditions that connect us. And that's those connection points that end up having such a tremendous impact on our ability to work together. And so it leads me to another question. Um, as I think about you know, each of us represented here, that I recognize that we represent and reflect a dichotomy, um, what some people would call a contradiction of our identities. Um, Rabbi Lawson um, is a Black Reconstructionist Jew, Dr. Coleman, and Amy Norba minister and scholar. Um, Donna and Lisa as students, activists, leaders in your own specific communities. And wondering if you all would mind sharing uh, how you reconcile the varying parts of your identities and the way that they surprise or challenge the assumptions of some of those around you. Um, uh, maybe quickly, um, I, I think for me, I, I don't 
I, I guess my, my simple straightforward answer would be that I don't reconcile them. I, I don't reconcile them at all because um, I don't see them in conflict. If other people do, that's their problem to fix and not mine. <laughs> So I just, you know, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I do understand the question and I think it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting and a thought provoking one, but I think there was a point at which I realized that um, the, the contradictions that people understood about who they expect me to be really aren't things that I have to spend time worrying about. My, my various, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm an African-American, I'm a Muslim in a world where people People maybe think that Muslims are supposed to be Arab or South Asian. Um, I come from a Christian family and that I still have, and there's still so much about how I was raised religiously that Im influences how I practice Islam, right? Um, but it, it, I, there's no way for me to separate those things out from one another. And, and I don't think I should have to. Um, and I think that when we expect people to do that sort of work, that sort of parsing out of who they are and what they've experienced um, one from the other, it's actually a sort of violence um, that you, you know that uh, you know that we you know that uh, that this society often sort of you know because we want to place people in boxes, and people don't belong in boxes. <laughs> So I, I, for me, I just, I mean, I get it and I understand, I, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, I don't mean that to say that I'm not aware of the ways in which that, that, that may cause people like me or people from my background or myself, that people might interpret me in a particular way and, and try to interface with me in a particular way and that there aren't material consequences or political consequences or whatever for how I am perceived in the world. But I try to make it my business um, to live holistically and let other people worry about whatever uh, whatever contra whatever problems those contradictions cause for them. Thank you for that, Donna. Um, a statement of strength that you do not have to accept and none of us has to accept what others try to project on us. Um, some of our other panelists, how do you manage that in your own lives? Yeah, I just want to echo what, what Donna said. I feel like I'm gonna do this whole program and be like, yeah, what Donna said. <laughs> Um, you know, I think um, one of the one of the challenges with the question is um, understanding how privilege works and understanding how whiteness works in this in this country. So when people see me, they think that oh wow, I didn't know Jews could be black or brown or, or gay or whatever. Um, and that you know that has that has a lot to do with the fact that um, like privileging whiteness. And when, yes, when when Eastern European Jews came to the United States, they were not seen as white as our country has evolved, more groups have been led into, into whiteness. And um, privilege allows people to lift up certain stories and cer certain narratives, which means that in the United States, Ashkenazi, Eastern European heritage has sort of gotten lifted up. The cultures of Eastern European Jews have gotten lifted up where other stories have been sort of marginalized. And so I'm not an Eastern European Jew, but Eastern European Jewry is not just about um, coming from uh, Eastern Europe. It's about a particular set of practices and, and, and beliefs and whatever. And so when people see me and they think I'm a contradiction, I, I, because I've spent all that time studying to become a rabbi and have thousands of years of history in my, in my head, you know, I can remind them of what Jews have always looked like. We've never been one race of people. Um, we are spread all over the world. Um, and, and I'm also not the only black rabbi. I'm, I'm not the only queer rabbi. So, um, you know, that, you know, that, and I think that for many people who ask that question, like I were, I used to be a chaplain in a retirement community and this woman of a certain age said, wow, your life must be so hard because you're black and, and um, yeah, you're, you're studying to be a rabbi. And I told her I was a vegan and she's like, oh my God, you got all these things. And I reminded her like, you know, life might not have been so easy for her when she grew up in the depression or, you know, whatever. And, and she didn't see it that way. And I said, exactly, like, I don't see my life is challenging. It's my life. It's the only one I have. It's the only one that I experience. And so for me, it's great. But I think from an outside perspective, you know, if you are someone with more privilege or a different set of privileges, or if you're white and male, you're looking at me, that might seem like I have a bunch of challenges. Um, and so or, or that I'm a contradiction. And that I think that's really hard sometimes for people um, to wrestle with um, as they have their own challenges uh, 
they had their own, they had their, their own assumptions challenged about, at least for me, what a Jew looks like. Thank you for that. And so I'm by the reality that each of us is having accomplished a number of things. We've earned some degrees. We've gotten some recognition. We're on the panel for IYC. And so we have been able to resolve some um, sense of how we manage this. But let's think about the interaction we have with our students in particular, who at a much different developmental stage. How do we want them then also equip others who may not come from the economies that we've experienced to be able to help them emphasis and in their communities? Yeah, um, if I can kind of be the religion professor answer here, <laughs> uh, valuing deeply and echoing many of what personally Donna and Sandra have said, I, you know, I guess I think of this in a couple ways when I'm teaching my students and what I also believe. One is that African American religiosity has always been plural, right? There's no way of being African American anything that is, you know, a Christian that's not a little bit Muslim in it too, or a Muslim's not a little bit Christian in it, or Christian or Muslim that's not a little bit African religion in it, right? Just because of the development of religion under and with the influence of the crucible of enslavement, right? That you had just this drawing together in many ways of many religious experiences. And so whatever kind of religious person you are as an African-American, you know, if you study enough, you'll see that there are elements of something else there anyway. So one is the reminder um, for me as African-American that our religiosity is a bit plural just by its own nature. Um, so that's one thing I teach to say that there's kind of a myth of purity <laughs> about, you know, what every tradition is and that all religions and cultures have bumped up against other peoples <laughs> over history and redefined and redefined and redefined themselves. And that's kind of part of what they do. So it's more of a kind of narrative myth, right? That there is a thing of what it means to be Christian or a thing of what it means to be Muslim. There are all types of ways to be inside each religion. And so because there are different ways in which there are to be in each religion, not everyone within one tradition believes the same things. And so that's one thing I'm always trying to say so that I might probably as a progressive Christian have more in common with a progressive Muslim and a progressive Jewish person than I would with a conservative Christian just by our, our culture and our politics, right? And so that's one thing I say. The other thing is because it's such a Christian centric and even sometimes Abrahamic centric way of do, thinking about religions, we assume all religions are about creed and about what you believe and adhering to a certain sense of beliefs or truth claims. And that's just not how all religions work. <laughs> Some religions like Ifa don't have a creed. You know, you are this because of how you practice of what you do, of how you honor ancestors, of what you do when people die, of what you do in certain, I, we don't have holy days in Yoruba tradition. I mean, we kind of have an Ifa new year, but that's it. You know, you just, you do what you do all the time. And you might do certain things at certain seasons if you feel, you know, if the context demands it, but there's not like a high holy day or days. Um, there's not a set of things that you would adhere to. And that's just, which is fine, but a reminder that not all traditions work the same way. And so there's not always a contradiction <laughs> if a tradition isn't asking you to adhere to a truth claim that doesn't conflict with a truth claim of whatever part of the tradition you're in. So I think remembering that there's a lot of plurality and that all religions don't work the same. Um, I've seen for my students is really mind blowing <laughs> and it, it helps them to think, oh, wow, you know, I have one experience with faith as they come to school, right? That the one they've had, and there are other ways to be either within their faith or to be other faiths. I think that really resonates with me as well in terms of, um, I guess, maybe bringing the last two questions together. Um, I think a contradiction that doesn't feel like a contradiction to me, but um, I think is something that as a sort of community builder is something that I work through with a lot of people is sort of um, being a loud Asian American woman can feel like a contradiction or um, pushing against 
this sort of model minority myth that says, you know, Asian Americans should be quiet and just sort of tolerate things and not rock the boat. Um, and I'm really lucky that no one in my family taught that to me, but it's really been interesting to sort of work with other people and sort of like work through this. Um, and I think one of the things that, that has really helped me is a recognition that maybe my parents and grandparents and great grandparents didn't call themselves an activist. Maybe that wasn't the term that they used, but they taught me very radical things. Um, and so, you know, it's the question I would ask myself is like, can I push myself to have a different conception of what political engagement looked like? You know, that maybe it didn't look like, um, a protest in the way I wanted it to look like a protest, but even the very fact that um, that there is a Japanese American Buddhism Buddhism for me to practice when Japanese American Buddhist leaders were arrested by the FBI um, and and detained um, by the FBI during World War II at rates that were disproportionate to any other community leaders or religious leaders within the Japanese American community, um, like that the fact that that 75 years ago, people built a temple for me in Chicago is a radical and political action. Um, again, maybe that's like not what I originally imagined um, protest to be, but it, I've sort of pushed the question back to myself to see like, are there ways that I can then redefine my understandings of, of, of political engagement, of joy, of celebration, of community building to be less sort of, um, these conceptions that I've, I've, I've imagined them to be and to be more attuned to perhaps um, what they looked like in, in the time and grateful for what I've then been able to receive from, from those generations before me. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I am very aware that oftentimes um, from the outside, people will look at religion and even race um, and culture and use it as something to say that, see, these people are all alike. And a large part of what we're saying is that actually our religion, particularly when it's been embedded in our race, ethnicity, our culture, is in some ways an act of protest that says there are a lot of ways that we are not alike. And that's okay. Um, it is still very much a celebration of who I am and what's important to me. And so um, in our closing minutes, I think we have about five or six minutes left, I want to pose the question, and it's a kind of a combined question because we did get a couple of questions in the Q&A, um, one about how we sustain ourselves, um, particularly in this difficult time, um, two about how we support uh, some of the groups that are more marginalized and limited on um, some of our majority campuses. Um, but then also this whole question about how we reframe what is considered to be normal. Um, because I think that's a lot of what each of us on this panel has done is challenge the idea of what is normal um, and what we're supposed to be according to the narrative that was written for us. Um, so as you consider that, um, how do you challenge the norms? Um, how do you sustain yourself in the midst of that? And how can we then transfer that to students who, and others who may need to do the same thing? And I'll invite everyone to respond to that question or offer anything else that you may have wanted to share in these final moments together. Um, in about one minute each. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tackle the, the sustaining ourselves. Um, so in, in my tradition, the Jewish tradition, if you look at our prayer books um, and like the morning liturgy, you know, there's um, like, you can wake up in the morning and say this day sucks. <laughs> or you could say, wow, this day is great. Or you could say this day sucks and then you pray and then it feels good. Um, but there's like all these, all these prayers for gratitude, all these blessings for gratitude. Like, you know, thank you God for giving me another day. Thank you for waking me up in the morning. You know, thank you for the birds and all that, all that stuff. And there's like tons and tons and tons and tons of that. And then we get to call to prayer. And then, you know, I think that the, 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 the people who wrote all this stuff down, um, realize that before you can receive a call to prayer, before you can be open 
to calling God for prayer, you need to be filled with gratitude. And so how I sustain myself during this time period is I try, um, I, I have a gratitude practice and I wake up and I think, uh, I try to be thankful for what, what I have. And, um, and then that allows me, I think, to um, move through the day with whatever challenges I have. And, um, and I think cultivating a gratitude practice um, is, is incredibly valuable. That does not mean that the world doesn't suck. It just means that um, you know you can uh, you can look at the world and see the beauty in, even in all the craziness. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Oh, see, you would come to me next. Um, you know, I guess I've been thinking about normal, right? Which is you know, and someone who does a lot of work with mental health and faith. It's kind of a problematic term anyway. Like, what is normal, right? I mean, I think this is something we have in our heads that there's this normal, and whatever I am, I'm deviating from it. Hmm. And it's just like a setup to make you feel bad about yourself. <laughs> and so, um, and whatever is even status quo, all status quos have problems, right? Even if there's some good parts about them, they have shortcomings. So I think it's really a great season to say, you know, what about how we operated before the onset of a global pandemic? you know, was good and we can hold on to. And what kicked rocks and we can just maybe let it go, right? And how many things, how many ways have we figured out to have community with people who aren't geographically near us? And how can we maintain this? And how can we continue to have conversations and celebrate and connect with people who are further away, as well as thinking about, okay, now how do we come back together? and in ways that are still going to be safe. Like maybe we'll never have big buffets again. It, it could be a long time. That, you know, that's not a, it's, it's okay, right? <laughs> you know, um, that's something we might miss. We might say, I can't believe we ever did that 10 years from now. Can you believe we all breathed in the same food and ate it, right? I mean, so the norm, norm change, right? <laughs> and five years from now, it might seem like, wow, why would anyone have ever have blown on a cake and then they all ate it, right? I mean, <laughs> we might not do that again, but cupcakes are fine, you know? So I think that it's a chance to, to really think about, you know, what we're, what we are, what the good things are we've gotten out of how we've had to adapt. And also while we also have felt, what is it we valued the most about what we've lost and how do we kind of creatively and safely hold on to the best of what we may have lost. And it's a good time to get rid of the things that were not helpful, that were divisive, that were exclusionary. Thank you so much for that. I'm sure many of us could relate to our buffet experiences and those buffet cakes with all of that spit flying out. <laughs> um, Lisa. Yeah, I think I've been in going back to sort of um, the the question of sustaining ourselves i've been thinking a lot about failure and how do i reframe my own relationship to failure or sort of challenges um in general and sort of navigating new things and i think about you know even in this in this webinar where we're having some tech issues i think that that's something where what i see instead of like you know a problem is that uh there's been greater collaboration sort of amongst this panel. I think a greater sense of listening and a greater practice of listening because we have to be more attentive to each other. Um, and so I think that there are just sort of all kinds of ways where I'm pushing myself to rethink um, what I've been taught about failure, what I've been taught about perfectionism, um, and then pushing myself to actually practice that, um, practice that in action every day. Thank you. And I do recognize our time is up, um, but Donna, I want to give you all, give you a chance for some closing comments. Um, I don't know, just briefly, I guess, I, as I was listening to everybody talk and thinking about the questions, um, there's a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, um, peace and blessings be upon him that came to mind. Um, and it is that um, the best, uh, the best acts are those which are done consistently, even if they're small. Um, and so I think about sustainability that was embedded in one of those questions that uh, came at the end and how do we how do we sort of continue what in the face of so much overwhelming, you know, 
dumpster fireness <laughs> that's that's going on around us. And I think um, if we can sort of, you know, just just you know, take it one day at a time and really try um, to you know find those little things that anchor you, um, that keep you um, you know sort of grounded and and staying and stable and and able to sort of just do a little bit more, um, you know, accept where you know that your life isn't. Um, going to, you know, or your productivity levels or whatever it is that we're all sort of grieving over and mourning and stressing about right now aren't necessarily going to be where they, where they were, and maybe they shouldn't be <laughs> where they were, because maybe we were doing, um, maybe we were doing too much um, in the service of things that didn't necessarily matter as much. Um, you know, so I think as we, as we sort of figure out what a new normal might look like, or a set of new normals might look like, let's say that we hope that we will build something that, um, that is at its core, more, more charitable, more sustainable, more merciful um, to, um, to all of us, not at our strongest, but at our weakest. Um, that one that takes care of those of us who are under normal circumstances, being ignored, marginalized, violated, um, uncared for. Um, I think we have the opportunity um, to really think about, um, and it's not going to be easy, even when faced with the profound series of crises that we're all faced with right now, to really imagine right. how we could make the world look different and make the world operate yeah. different. But that's what we have to do. Um, Absolutely. But little by little. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, um, for an amazing conversation. And I'm just hearing, um, I would say, two final things that were echoed repeatedly. Um, race religion, ritual are all deeply intertwined. And particularly in this moment in which we find ourselves in, we are called to rethink and determine what is truly important to us and to find ways to celebrate that and then to be willing to let go of the others. And so with that, I will once again express my thanks to you all, not just for your comments, but for your help as my um, internet decided to conspire in this one moment. And I will turn things back over to the IFYC staff.